Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 5, Chapter 19, Text 25. And this is Sukadev Goswami describing to Maharaj Parikshit the um, atmospheres in the different parts of the universe. And this is Jambadweep and the tracts of land in Jamadweep. And right now, he's describing the tract of land where we're situated, Bharata Varsa, and the predominating deity there, here, there, here, is Naranarayan. And he is performing austerities at Bhadarik Ashram for the upliftment of human society. And the foremost devotee of Naranarayan is Narada Muni, who travels throughout the entire universe, glorifying the Lord and serving the Lord in various ways. <laughs> he is the direct son of Lord Brahma, the engineer of the universe. So this is Narada Muni's prayers to Narayan Rishi. And previously he was describing how even the, the, the demigods on the heavenly planets, with all their opulence and all their facilities for sense gratification, they're hankering to take birth in Bharata Varsa because even though the lifespan is very short and the sense gratif the level of sense gratification doesn't even is, you can't even compare it to what the demigods have but the great advantage of Bharata Varsa is that in one very short lifetime a person can go back home back to Godhead the Varnashram system is available on planet Earth. And if it disappears for a little while, it can always be it can always remanifest, easily remanifest the Varnashram system, which allows for the uh, progressive step by step advancement to the point of devotional service, which is the only way back home, back to Godhead. And evidently that's not available on the other planets. Obviously, if the demigods are praying like this, it's not available in the higher planets. What they have is a uh, very, 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 very long life. Very long life. Thousands and thousands of years they live. And it's all wonderful, all enjoyable, whatever they want. Sense gratification, there it is. <clears throat> no problem. And no disease. <clears throat> and no getting old. They're just born, enjoy like anything for eons and eons, and then die. But where they go when they leave that demigod body, they have to go to the lower planets so they can if they're not devotees, if they're simply interested in sense gratification, so they can build up more pious credits. It's like a uh, person works all week, and then on the weekend they, have a, they get a paycheck on Friday, and then they can go enjoy a little bit on the weekend. <laughs> so the heavenly planets, they have to have built up so much pious credits, <laughs> lifetime after lifetime after lifetime, to work so hard, performing Vedic sacrifices, giving in charity, uh, performing austerities, so many different things. It's all on the material platform. It's not devotional. It's 
because they want to go on vacation on the weekend. <laughs> uh, yeah, that principle can be seen in so many different places, can be seen in terms of the workplace. But just recently, um, we have a relative who's been, a, been living in a um, senior, a senior in his 90s, he, he's living in a retirement center. And it's a big business, a huge business especially in Florida, which is very warm climate. Everyone comes, uh, when they get old, they all come to the warm climate. So it's a huge industry in Florida, catering to the uh, seniors. <laughs> and they make everything available. There's a little barber shop in there, and the dining hall is like a restaurant. They have they're served their food by people that look like waiters, and they have a menu. Whatever they want, they'll cook for them. Uh, there's medical staff on hand all the time. There's planned entertainment. They have uh, live performances and singers. They have card games. They have church services. It's, it's like a whole city. They never even have to leave. It's a lot of buildings all connected. It's hallways and hallways and hallways. Of there's probably, I don't know, three, four hundred people that live there. And they all have their little apartments. And if they need help bathing or dressing, then someone helps them bathe and dress them. And it's all taking their money, their hard-earned money, that their whole life they worked hard, they saved up, little bit, little bit, and now they worked hard, all their like their pious credits, and now they get to be waited on hand and foot. And it's not exactly an ideal situation. I mean, how much can you enjoy when you're, you're in your 90s? You know, <laughs> everything hurts. <laughs> Nothing works right. But the mentality is, I can see it with this relative also, is that there's someone very important, and there are... Uh, paying out all their money, their hard-earned money, maintaining these other people. Because these other people that are serving them in the barber shop and the this and the that. And everyone is very, oh, yes, sir, like they're a very important person. Like my relative laughs, he, he sings the Here Comes the President song, like he's the president, you know. And they all bow and scrape, you know, because they're making a lot of money off of these people. <laughs> it's just the arrangement, it's not like it's something insidious. It's just the whole material world is insidious. But it's like walking into like a, a movie set. There's no Krishna. There's no idea of not this body or transcendence. It's just um, trying to enjoy with the last little bit of whatever's left of a material body. <laughs> but you can see it in the people's eyes. They're just waiting for death. It's a very, uh, very strange place like that, the atmosphere. And every day the ambulances come and someone expires and they just cart them off. <laughs> but the show goes on, the little barber shop and the restaurant that looks like a dining room and the people dress up, they put jewelry on and their nicest clothes, they're going to go out to dinner in the um, senior center dining room with the walkers and the wheelchairs. And <laughs> it's all the things they did in their youth when their bodies were good and solemn. And now all shriveled up and unable to do so many things, but still going through the motions of everything they used to do when they were physically, uh, when the body was physically fit. And the mentality now, and so these people that are serving them hand and foot, what are they doing? They're gathering their pious credits. And what are they doing? Well, they're maintaining themselves and their families, and hopefully putting something aside. I mean, 
if, if they're going to play this game, they have to put something aside so that they can be in that position of everyone waiting on them and then they'll use up their pious credits getting uh, waited on. <laughs> now they're doing the waiting, the serving and the waiting. This is the material energy, the serving and the waiting. In the future, they'll be the ones served and waited on. And they get a taste of it maybe on the weekends when they go out and they go to a, a, an actual restaurant and they get waited on. They get served. People love to go out to these restaurants and have the pretty weight on them. So. And they use up their prize credits like that, <laughs> or their money. It's uh, reflections of this going on everywhere, but the biggest one is this going to the heavenly planets, serving the demigods by performing the austerities and the penances and, and then gathering all these pious material credits and then going to the heavenly planets and getting waited on. You're a very important person, your demigod. And you're maintaining others. What do the demigods do? They maintain others. And how are they maintaining their others? By using up their pious credits. The demigods are in charge of the rain. And, the, and how are they in charge of the rain? Somehow or other, they're paying for it. <laughs> and they're paying for the rain with the credits, the pious credits. And when it's all used up, and they're not waited on hand and foot anymore, then they have to come back down and start serving and like that. Is it a cycle? The cycle of birth and death doesn't just mean the cycle of birth and death, it means the cycle of karma. They're connected. The karmic reactions is what takes the living entity through the cycle of birth and death. And it's the desires within the, that are stored within the mind that determine the course of actions that accrue these karmic reactions. And it just keeps building up, building up. As soon as one is as soon as one karmic reaction is burnt up, <laughs> used up, it was described that for these different desires within the mind, if the karmic reactions that are built up there, it takes one lifetime to burn one up. It can take a lifetime to burn one up. But what are they doing in that lifetime if they're not person isn't engaging in transcendental activity to the Supreme Lord, becoming detached from trying to enjoy the material nature, then they're just building up another one, which means another material birth. And that birth is determined by that karmic reaction and that desire within the mind. So to purify the mind, is very, very important. Because the heart is the seat of all the emotions. But as long as the mind is contaminated, then those emotions simply transfer to material illusory forms. When the mind is purified, then those emotions can be transferred to the pure spiritual forms. And the path back home, back to Godhead, opens up. So the spiritual master is the representative of the Lord, and by the grace of the pure devotees and the great saints and sages and the self-realized souls, who are situated on that platform of loving. Loving means emotion, emotional, devotional service to the Lord. They're not jnanis, although they have all knowledge. But their special distinguishing feature is their emotional connection to the Lord, devotion, the heartfelt, loving relate, And that's what the Lord is looking for. That's his pleasure. That's his pleasure. So we say devotional service, devotion. What's motivating that devotion? Loving emotion, 
loving emotions. Love, love means emotion. <laughs> Unless you're talking about loving ice cream. And I don't know what kind of emotion you would have on ice cream. It's sense gratification, you can't love ice cream. <laughs> or sometimes loving other people. I love my wife or I, my husband or I love my children. Why do we love them? Because the soul is there. As soon as the soul is gone, do you love that body, that dead body lying there? No. So what did you love? You loved the soul that was there. <clears throat> but if the mind is contaminated, then there's some confusion about that. While the soul is within the body, you think that the person is the body. So this Krishna consciousness teachings and philosophy and great saints and acharyas, Krishna conscious saints and acharyas, spiritual masters. We're empowered by Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to spread this Krishna consciousness movement. So, after sharing all of that, how about reading some Bhagavatam? And Canto 5, Chapter 19, Text 25, Narada Muni continues. And um, this is translated with commentaries by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, the founder Acharya of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. I offer my most humble, respectful obeisances to such a spiritual master. Translation, Prabhupada's translation. Bharata Varsa offers the proper land and circumstances in which to execute devotional service, which can free one from the results of jnana karma. If one attains a human body in the land of Bharata Varsa with clear sensory organs with which to execute Sankirtan Yagna, but in spite of this opportunity, he does not take to devotional service. He certainly like liberated forest animals and birds that are careless and therefore bound by a hunter. Mm. That's quite a picture. In other words, what we're getting here is an indication that material energy is not something passive. It's like um, animals in the forest. There's every opportunity they will be hunted. And actually, they hunt each other too. That's another story. But here, the, the, there are predators, you know, tigers eat the deer and stuff. So in the forest, there are, there's a, something going on there. It's not just you know, la-la land. But there are dangers, dangers in the forest. And the person who does not take up the practice and begin to engage in devotional service and devotional activities to the Supreme Lord, it's not that they just fall away. No, they're, they're hunted. They're captured. They're captured. They're captured by the illusory energy. Hmm. Liberated forest animals and birds that are careless and are therefore again bound by a hunter. You take birth in Varta Varsa, this nice human form. It's very, very suitable for devotional service. Hearing, chanting, engaging and serving the deity, worshiping, offering prayers, associating with great souls, enlivening each other, and the path back home, back to Godhead. And if they don't do that, a person doesn't do that, given this nice human facility, which is compared here to being like a, a liberated position, 
human, human facility has all opportunities. It's like the animals and birds were roaming around free, flying in the trees and having just a good old time. But if they're careless, then the hunter can catch them. So what is that carelessness? It means being enamored by the material sense enjoyment, becoming overly attached. That's the carelessness. Being distracted for whatever reason. And the mind will prevent, pre, present so many good reasons to become distracted, very important reasons to become distracted. And practically, the mind will shout Pay attention to this. This is very, very important. Don't chant right now. You have to do this other thing. It's absolutely necessary. The mind will shout like that. It's just a distraction. You can just imagine what it will be like at the time of death, how the mind will be shouting. My God, this is an emergency. Why are you trying to think of Krishna? Look, it's an emergency. The house is on fire. You have to do something. And of course, there's nothing that you can do. At the time of death, there's nothing that can be done. But still, the mind, if it's not trained in Krishna consciousness, we don't practice now while we're functional, to whatever degree we're functional, <laughs> in these bodies, we don't practice curtailing the mind by engaging it in chanting Hare Krishna and hearing about Krishna and convincing the mind that this is the actual most important thing. Whatever the mind is thinking is so important isn't. It's not. It's material. material there are no material solutions to material problems. The solution to all problems is spiritual. So we practice like that. So here, someone who doesn't do that, then they will be captured by the mind. They will be captured by the distractions, they'll be captured by the illusions, be captured by maya. So we have such a great opportunity to practice now. When the mind starts bearing down on us, especially when it starts to yell <laughs> I demand. That's great when it does that, because that's an opportunity to deal with it straight on. Just deal with it straight on. And tears, crying, crying, begging for the mercy of the Lord is very effective. When the mind does that, cry and chant. <laughs> Cry, just cry. <laughs> this, I don't know how this relates, but <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, I'm a pretty good driver when I have to drive. I really don't like driving. I use my bicycle most of the time now, but I do have to drive sometimes. And I, I really don't like to now. Uh, people drive very crazy now, and the gas is so expensive. So if I can use the bicycle, I will. It's, just, it's nice, good exercise, fresh air. Um, but uh, if I do use the, the car, and I haven't, this hasn't happened in a really long time, but if it ever does happen, I get stopped by a policeman, well, maybe I didn't see the red light, or maybe I thought I could get through the light before it changed, and I couldn't. You know, different things happen when you're driving even to good drivers. Um, you know, if they give you a ticket, it's very expensive and it makes your insurance go up and it's just horrible you know, to get a ticket. So if I have done something wrong, either because I tried to get away with something, which I shouldn't have, you know, these things happen, or I didn't notice it, which is possible, um, and the policeman pulls me over and the lights and everything, I cry. I cry. 
because he's coming, he's presenting himself as the authority, okay? And it's very important, I have to listen to him because there's going to be consequences. If I don't listen to him, there's going to be serious consequences. So sometimes the mind presents itself like that. If you don't listen to me, there's going to be very serious consequences. Sometimes the mind is like a policeman. <laughs> you know, you did this thing and now there's going to be, you're going to have these reactions and you have to figure it out and, and you, you, now you're really in trouble. You shouldn't have done that. What made you do that? Why did you do The mind will go on and on and on. When at the time, I was doing the best I could. See, like with the driving, I, I, I was doing the best I could. I, it did, I wasn't purposefully trying to, you know, I just, you know, these things happen. Um, so similarly, things will happen in life. You thought you made a good decision and whoops, you could have made a better decision and now you've got to deal with it and all this. And the mind will go on and on and on. So like with the policeman, I found if I just cry, and I show him that it wasn't a bad intention. I'm not a, um, a belligerent person. I'm not intoxicated. And I'm going to do the very best I can in the future not to make the same mistake. And what I found is they just sort of shake their head and go, well, just be careful in the future. And they go away. And I'm respectful. You know, I respect, you know, what he's trying to do, his service. And they go away. And sometimes I cry a little bit, like, because I don't want my insurance to go up. <laughs> and also, I, I appreciate it. I say thank you, you know. It, it's, this will help me to be more attentive. I must have been inattentive. And this is going to help me to pay attention more. I really appreciate I actually thank them. And I appreciate he does a hard job like this. And then he, he goes away. He's like, okay. Yeah. It's, no necessary, it's not necessary to beat the dead horse, this person. Yeah, they, they're all right. They just made a little slip. Everybody makes a little slip. And they go away. So with the mind also, the mind's actually just trying to do its job. The mind is a policeman. It's in charge of... A big city, the body, is like a city. It has to police the city and make sure every... And if I made some sort of a decision that's going to put the city into danger, or it's going to endanger dangerous situation, then the police, is going to, the police are going to come. That's the mind. The mind acts like a policeman sometimes. But if I'm sincerely trying to take shelter of Krishna, and I acknowledge that the mind is really just trying to do its job. And I, I'm actually respectful that the mind is trying to do its job. And sometimes maybe I'll cry because I'm trying to surrender to Krishna. And the mind is coming here yelling, screaming, what did you do, what did you do? <laughs> Or there are other things the mind can do, you know, it's, it's always connected to um, being distracted from Krishna. So actually the mind is the best friend. When the mind does that and starts screaming and yelling about this, that, and the other thing, it's actually a friend, just like the policeman was your friend. The policeman was actually a friend. In that situation, I mean, there's other things that are going on these days. A lot of people are working as policemen that may not be qualified. Now, that's another story. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a sincere soul who's serving and supporting himself and his family by doing police work. It's very dangerous. So the mind also is just trying to do its service. And the mind may not see the whole picture, but... And we're sincerely trying to surrender to Krishna, and the mind will back off. To actually cry for Krishna, that is.
is uh, that's sincere. <laughs> Real tears from the eyes for Krishna. Krishna sees that. And he's in the heart of the policeman also, so he calls the policeman off. And the mind is controlled by the demigods, and the Lord is within the heart of the demigods also. So Krishna is the supreme controller. When you're trying to surrender to Krishna, then the Lord within the heart of the demigod is going to be able to give you some relief from the mind. It's Krishna. Krishna is within the heart of everyone. Krishna is within everyone and everything, animate and inanimate. So this crying for Krishna is very nice. <laughs> it's very much a part of uh, Lord Chaitanya's pastimes. Everyone's always crying. <laughs> it's very nice, very nice. So Prabhupada's commentary. In the land of Bharata Varsa, one can very easily perform Sankirtan Yagna, which consists of Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, or one can perform other methods of devotional service, such as Smaranam, Vandanam, Archanam, Dasyam, Sakyam, Atmanavedanam. In Bharata Varsa, one has the opportunity to visit many holy places especially Lord Chaitanya's birth site and Lord Krishna's birth site, Navadvip and Vrindavan, where there are many pure devotees who have no desire other than to execute devotional service. Anyabala sita sunyam jnana karma jnanavritam. And one may thus become free from the bondage of material conditions. Other paths, such as the path of jnana and the path of karma, are not very profitable. Pious activities can elevate one to the higher planetary systems, and by speculative knowledge one can merge into the Brahman existence, but that's not real profit, for one has to come down again even from the liberated condition of being merged in Brahman, and certainly one must come down from the heavenly kingdom. One should endeavor to go back home, back to Godhead, yanti mad yajinopimam, Otherwise, there's no difference between human life and the lives of jungle animals and birds. Animals and birds also have freedom, but because of their lower birth, they cannot use it. Taking advantage of all the facilities offered him, a human being who has taken birth in the land of Bharata Varsa should become a fully enlightened devotee and go back home, back to Godhead. This is the subject matter of the Krishna consciousness movement. The inhabitants of places other than Bharata-Varsa have facilities for material enjoyment, but they do not have the same facility to take to Krishna consciousness. Therefore, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has advised, one who has taken birth as a human being in Bharata-Varsa must first realize himself as part and parcel of Krishna, and after taking to Krishna consciousness, he must distribute this knowledge all over the world. Mm. Wow, Prabhupada, that's, it's all right there in that purport. Jnana and karma, they're not, they don't offer up an eternal solution. Someone who works hard for jnana and karma, they get the, the elevation, but it doesn't stay, they have to come back down. Hmm. With the human being who takes birth, in the land of Bharata Varsa. Now, there's two ways to understand Bharata Varsa right now. One way is the whole planet is referred to as Bharata Varsa. But due to the effects of Kali Yuga, it's not recognizable as Bharata Varsa. India, it has shrunk down to this one country, India, over the centuries. It's, it has shrunk down, and it's still recognizable. The Bharata Varsa is recognizable there. It's like um, if you have 
the whole planet's like a beautiful cultivated garden and then it begins to deteriorate and turns into like jungle and swamp and which is of course beautiful too, the mode of goodness, but we're talking about bar to bar so it gets all overgrown and um hardly recognizable. So the um India is like that. It's and the effects of Kali Yuga are very strong in India also. But this is Lord Chaitanya's movement. And specifically those who have taken birth in Bharata Varsa, human beings. Specifically in India, where the system is still recognizable, although it's being attacked, it's still recognizable, the Varnashram. It could be revived very easily, and that's part of Lord Chaitanya's movement, is to revive this Varnashram system. And that's very great service of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, is to revive this Varnashram Dharma. And Lord Chaitanya has made the whole planet. See, by spreading the Krishna Consciousness movement, the chanting of Hare Krishna, in all the countries of the world, Bharata Varsa is now spreading, is reviving. That the chanting of the holy names of the Lord is present in every town and village by the mercy of Lord Chaitanya and his pure devotees and those that are serving his pure devotees. That means the whole planet now is going to be understood to be Bharata Varsa again, reviving, coming out of India, that tract of land in India. So again, in every purport, Prabhupada is making this appeal specifically to Indians here, he's talking, that everyone who's born in this land of Bharata Varsa, where it's recognizable, India, it's recognizable, he was just talking about the holy places, that they're available to visit and that there are pure devotees there, that every, in Bar the Indians, those who have taken birth there specifically, take up this Krishna consciousness movement, make your life perfect, and then help to spread it to the rest of the world, to revive this Varnashram, Krishna consciousness, for the benefit of the whole world, to revive Bharata Varsa, Pretty exciting. Pretty pretty big mission. Lots to do. <laughs> For Krishna. <laughs> Text twenty six. In India, Bhartavarsa, there are many worshippers of the demigods. The various officials appointed by the Supreme Lord, such as Indra, Chandra, and Surya all of whom are worshipped differently. <clears throat> the worshippers offer the demigods their oblations, considering the demigods part and parcel of the whole, the Supreme Lord. Therefore, the Supreme Personality of Godhead accepts these offerings and gradually raises the worshippers to the real standard of devotional service by fulfilling their desires and aspirations. Because the Lord is complete, he offers the worshippers the benedictions they desire, even if they worship only part of his transcendental body. <clears throat> yeah, there's, there's different, pers different types of people who worship the demigods. Persons who worship the demigods by considering them part and parcel of the Supreme Lord, they're not demons. They will make gradual... Uh, progress. Krishna says he accepts those offerings when they're offered to the demigods. And gradually they will make um, progress in devotional service because they recognize the demigod is part and parcel of the Supreme Lord, but they have some material desires. So Krishna, the Lord, he gives them, the, what's the big deal for him to give someone their material desires? It's not a big deal. The big deal is to be overly attached. 
and to forget the Lord. But here they're not forgetting the Lord. They're going through the demigods, seeing the demigods as part and parcel of the Lord, but they have material desires. So do the, mater so do the demigods. <laughs> There's an opportunity <coughs> for making advancement in devotional service. There's a spark there. Hmm. And gradually, it says, gradually raises the worshipers to the real standard of devotional service. Now, there are demons who worship the demigods because they hate Krishna. They want to kill Krishna. You have um, Ravana and Hiranyakashipu. They worship the demigods. They had material desires. But, um, we were just reading in Chaitanya Bhagavat that Advaita Prabhu, the Lord, is past time there. They're going back and forth in loving exchange. And the Lord tells Advaita that he's so pleased with him after they had a, an interesting uh, something, pastime. <laughs> but um, Lord Advaita, in order to, he wanted to experience special mercy from Lord Chaitanya. <laughs> now, Lord Advaita is a combined incarnation of Mahavishnu and Lord Shiva. He's combined incarnation in the body, in the person, transcendental body, in the person of Sri Advaita. So he, um, in order to experience special mercy from Lord Chaitanya, he decided he was going to preach that devotional service was not very important, and the most important thing was impersonal realization. <clears throat> so he began preaching like that. He had students, and he, he, was, he was attracting people, and sure enough, Lord Chaitanya became quite angry and uh, actually struck him, went there and yelled at him and struck him. What are you doing? Why are you doing this? This is horrible. And Lord Edwait said, ah, the perfection of my life. <laughs> so these are pastimes, and the Lord defeated the impersonal philosophy. He enacted this pastime of the Lord defeating impersonalists. <clears throat> Lord had wait to play that part. And uh, so <clears throat> after they were through and they, they had enjoyed this pastime together, um, Lord Chaitanya was so pleased with Advaita. He told him that whatever you speak will be, uh, whatever you speak will be the truth. The, ve the absolute truth. Whatever you speak will be the absolute truth. And Lord Advaita um, uh, Oh boy, where was I going with that? Oh no. <laughs> well, we were discuss I was discussing how um, there's an opportunity for advancement there because one who recognizes that they are the, the demigods are part and parcel of the Supreme Lord. There's a spark there. Well, it's gone. Hmm. And benedictions they desire, even if they worship only part of this transcendental body. Hmm. Uh, I must have related somehow, but I guess the thread wasn't strong enough, so it's gone. But it was a nice pastime anyway, remembering how Lord Chaitanya Gave it way to a good smack. <laughs> what is it? The kick and the kiss of the Lord. They're wonderful. So you got a smack. <laughs> His life became perfect. 
Um, so I'm going to read the verse again because somehow I went off on that tangent. In India, Bharata Varsha, there are many worshippers of the demigods. The various officials appointed by the Supreme Lord, such as Indra Chandra and Surya, all of them, all of whom are worshipped differently. The worshippers offer the demigods their oblations, considering the demigods part and parcel of the whole, the Supreme Lord. Therefore, the Supreme Personality of Godhead accepts these offerings and gradually raises the worshippers to the real standard of devotional service by fulfilling their desires and aspirations. Because the Lord is complete, he offers the worshippers the benedictions they desire, even if they worship only part of his transcendental body. Prabhupada's Commentary in Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says, Mahatmanas tu mamparta daivim prakriti masrita bhajantyanya manaso yatvabhutadim avyayam. Translation, O son of Prita, those who are not deluded, the great souls, are under the protection of the divine nature. They're fully engaged in devotional service because they know me as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, original and inexhaustible. Mahatma, advanced devotees, worship only the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Others, however, who are also sometimes called Mahatmas, worship the Lord as Ekatvena Pritatvena. In other words, they accept the demigods as different parts of Krishna and worship them for various benedictions. Although the devotees of the demigods thus achieve the desired results offered by Krishna, they have been described in Bhagavad Gita as Ritagyana, not very intelligent. Krishna does not desire to be worshipped indirectly through the different parts of his body. Krishna wants direct devotional worship. Therefore, a devotee who directly worships Lord Krishna through staunch devotional service, as recommended in Srimad Bhagavan, Tivrena Bhakti Yogina Yajita Purushamparam is very quickly elevated to the transcendental position. Nevertheless, devotees who worship the demigods, the different parts of the Lord, receive the benedictions they desire because the Lord is the original master of all benedictions. If anyone wants a particular benediction, for the Lord to award it is not at all difficult. Hmm. Hmm. So it was pretty clear there that it's not like they're demons or they're completely lost, someone who is engaged in demigod worship. And they'll get there to eventually, become gradually purified, get there. But better is to go right away, engage directly. He says that's what Krishna wants. He wants direct devotional service. He wants worship different parts of his transcendental body. He wants worship of him, himself. Of course, Krishna is not different from the different parts of his body. In one sense, Krishna is everything. Does that mean you can worship a piece of dirt? <laughs> so, everything's part of Krishna. Everything's expanded from Krishna. And one who sees like that sees things as they are. They see Krishna everywhere. But there is also Krishna. <laughs> Not just Krishna's expansions or his different parts and parcels. But one who sees things in relationship to Krishna will make advancement. That's what's going on here. They see the demigods in relationship to Krishna. And they don't worship Krishna directly, but they worship something, that someone who's expanded from Krishna. And they see that very powerful personality in relationship to Krishna, and they'll make some advancement. They're not cutting Krishna out of the picture, trying to steal anything. But better to go to Krishna directly. And you say, well, you can't go to Krishna directly. You have to go through his pure representative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the spiritual master. And the spiritual master is offering pure devotional service. And when someone approaches the spiritual master, they don't approach for anything material. 
So with the demigods, that's not what's going on. The person that is approaching is not asking, please engage me in devotional service. They're doing business with the demigods. You know, I give you this, and you give me that, and I know you've got good connections with Krishna, so you can do it. And I want this, and I want that, and I, I'm giving you this. It's like business deal. <laughs> they expect something in exchange for their offerings. But because they're seeing this powerful living entity, this demigod, in relationship to Krishna, then they will make some advancement. And also, it's not hard for Krishna to supply whatever they want. They want um, a good business, they want a lot of money, they want a beautiful wife, they want a husband, or they want whatever they want. Position, government position, who knows what they want. It's not hard for Krishna to benedict that. Good health, and Krishna can give it. And give it in such a way that they don't forget Krishna, that the demigod is part and parcel of Krishna, and that that's where the demigod is getting their, their power from. And then gradually they can make advancement. Like the Varnashram system, by following, it's such a nice system. Everyone has what they need. They're engaged nicely. Sense gratification is not so much of a problem. Natural resources are not abused because it's in line with the nature, the material, the way nature is designed. Mode of goodness, I like this. The, the modes are occupations within the modes are clear. Those in the mode of passion, they engage in kshatriya activities. Those in the mode of goodness engage in brahminical. And those influenced by the modes of ignorance and passion, a mixed mode, they are doing the farming and the cow protection. And those that are in the mode of ignorance, they're the helpers for everybody else, suitors. It's very nicely organized according to the way material nature functions. The modes are... Um, they're very clear, and the management is there. So then, whose system is that? Just like with the demigod, oh, where they're getting their powers from? From Krishna. So where's this nice system of management coming from? It's coming from Krishna. So they make advancement. Become a little appreciative of the creator and designer of this wonderful Varnashram system. Become a little appreciative in, in this uh, great personality who is empowering this demigod to give me all these things. But that's not how a, a spiritual master is approached. A spiritual master is approached for devotional service, not asking for anything material. So that's a little difference there. Now, there is a line of disciplic succession coming from Lord Shiva. And Lord Shiva is a demigod. He's actually not exactly a demigod. He's in a very unique category. He's, he's slightly more than a demigod, although he acts like a demigod at different times. And he is a pure devotee of the Lord. And so he can be approached for devotional service. And there is a line of disciplic succession coming from Lord Shiva, Rudra Sampradaya. And our line of disciplic succession is coming from Lord Brahma, who's also a demigod. He has huge uh, managerial responsibilities for the material universe. And he's in our line of disciplic succession, so in one sense we are approaching through a demigod, Lord Brahma. But we don't worship Lord Brahma for material things. We worship Lord Brahma because of his Krishna consciousness. We know he's a pure devotee. We read his Brahma Sanhita, can understand he's fully engaged 
on the Transcendental Platform. Everything he's doing is in pure devotional service. So he's, he's a great devotee of the Lord, Lord Brahma. But it isn't always the case in every material universe that Lord Brahma is a pure devotee. And we know he went through his, uh, his spiritual journey. We have record of it in the Bhagavatam, his performance of austerities and his meditation and who am I, why am I here, what's my purpose. He went through a lot of that. And then he also had some difficulties the material uh, nature, the modes, um, challenged him in many different ways. But he came out, came out victorious by surrendering to Krishna. He's a great devotee. He has his journey also, that living entity who has taken birth as Lord Brahma, demigod Brahma. So it's in how we approach these personalities. Approach for material things, it's going to be slow. But it's still accepted by Krishna. And he gives the material things. What is it? If Krishna likes you, he gives you everything. But if he loves you, he takes everything away. What does that mean, he takes everything away? It, it could mean he takes everything away. <laughs> <laughs> for that reason, sometimes people don't want to approach Krishna. He's known, famous for that, taking away. But ta what he takes away is the attachment. The attachment. And that attachment then becomes fixed on Krishna himself. That's how he takes away. He takes away. He takes away the attachment to the material forms, illusory forms. And that attachment then transfers to the spiritual, eternal forms of bliss and knowledge. Eternity. So. <laughs> so, yes. Stop there. Hare Krishna.